Well, good morning. What a wonderful time of worship. Thanks to our children for leading us and for their teachers that have uh, prepared them so well. Great time here in the gathering. Look forward to the next time we get to do that. Y'all ever had to give a, a, an oral presentation at school or, or work or anything like that? Show of hands if you had to do that. Now, keep your hand up for me. Keep, keep your hand up uh, if it was a flawless, picture-perfect presentation. Anybody? Anybody? No? Okay. All right. Not too many hands there. Public speaking. It's the stuff of nightmares, right? It's up there with root canals and IRS audits, among the things that people would rather avoid. Some studies claim that public speaking is actually the number one phobia in the world. Like in the whole world. Weird. I mean, I would have thought it would be like death or war or snakes, you know. No, those things are fine. Just don't make us talk in front of anybody. They say if you get nervous when you're public speaking, you should picture the audience in their underwear. I don't do that to you guys, so don't worry. But, uh, but public speaking can be nerve-wracking. You know, in, uh, in ninth grade, I had to give a presentation in front of my biology class, and my presentation included these two words. Now, I know that you know, but I just want to clarify for everybody in the room that these words are pronounced metropolitan and Thailand. But in ninth grade, I thought they were pronounced metropolitan and Thailand. So that was good. And in case you're wondering, this is why people are afraid of public speaking. If you mispronounce two words in front of your ninth grade biology class, they will make fun of you. They will. They, and, and they will not let you forget it all through the rest of high school. Like every spring, they'll ask you, Daniel, where are you going on vacation this summer? Thailand? Brutal. It's brutal. Uh, welcome to week three of After Easter, the series where we're considering the work of the Holy Spirit, both through the book of Acts and in our own lives today. We'll be in Acts chapter four this morning. You feel free to turn there now if you'd like to follow along, Acts chapter four. And this week, we're going to see that the Spirit speaks, the Holy Spirit speaks he speaks through God's people, and, and, and as we learn to walk with the Spirit and to rely on Him in various situations, we will find ourselves speaking up, even when we know that our words might trip us up. The Spirit gives us boldness, He gives us clarity, and He gives us the ability to speak what God wants to communicate to that group, to that person, or in that situation. And this is exactly what happened in Acts 4. We'll start in verse 1 says, the, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. And they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So Peter and John are sharing the gospel in the temple. And part of the gospel message is resurrection from the dead. You can't separate the gospel of Jesus from resurrection. And we could spend quite a while there, but uh, let it be said that resurrection is at the very center of the good news about Jesus and what it means to follow him. You really can't have one without the other. So no, not, not only were they preaching about Jesus, they were also uh, teaching about the resurrection from the dead. And this is really the reason that they were detained, uh, certainly because they were teaching about Jesus, but the thing that the Sadducees and the temple guard, those officials that would have been under their authority, uh, they're, they're really upset that the disciples are teaching about resurrection because this is a really big deal for them. They, they didn't believe in resurrection. That was an essential issue in, in the Sadducees' belief system. That for them, when you die, you die. There's no resurrection. There, you know, you're, just, you're just gone. It's end of consciousness. That's why they're sad, you see, because uh, they didn't believe that you could be resurrected. They're sad, you see. Okay. So they have major issues with what Peter and John are, are preaching. In verse 3, it says they seized them. And because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. And the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. So in the ancient world, jails served primarily as holding cells, uh, just a way of detaining individuals uh, until they could be questioned the next day. And here, Peter and John are detained 
not only for their preaching, but because Peter had also just healed a disabled man. You may recall in Acts chapter 3, there's a story of a man who's begging for alms at the gate, and, uh, and he's, he, he asks, he's asking for alms, and Peter doesn't have any money, but he tells him, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, get up and walk. And the man who had been uh, lame for many, many years, he does. He gets up and, and walks, and it's this remarkable display of the power and the authority that Peter and John operate under, which of course, inevitably drew attention from the authorities. And so the two apostles are then brought before this group of the most powerful men in the temple community, perhaps the most powerful men in the Jewish religion at the time. And these men ask them, by what power or what name did you do this? By what power or what name did you do this? Imagine being Peter and John in this moment. I mean, you just spent the night in jail. Now you're being dragged before this assembly of religious authorities. Their very presence, radiating power and control among them are some of the very same men who orchestrated Jesus's crucifixion. They stand before these men and they're just being grilled. They, they, and they know what could come next. Flogging, maybe exile from the city, possibly even death. Notice the next verse. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone the builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. What a moment. What a speech. And not only is he still preaching about Jesus, something he was literally just arrested for doing, not only is he still preaching about resurrection, something the Sadducees and their posse had detained him for, but here he stands before some of the most powerful men in his country, men who have the power to have him killed. And he points the finger of accusation at them and says, remember Jesus whom you killed? Well, he didn't stay dead. God vindicated him from the grave and it's by his name and by his power and his spirit that we do these things. This doesn't sound like the the, the immature, impulsive fishermen that we read about in the gospels, does it? it? It certainly doesn't sound like the scared, panicked runaway who literally just two months before this had denied knowing Jesus in order to avoid the wrath of these very men. Something has happened to Peter. He's different. And the Jewish authorities notice it too. It says when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. So often when we talk about sharing our faith or, or even just dialoguing with people about Christianity or about the Lord, I, I so often hear fellow Christians say things like, I'm not a theologian. I, 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 don't, I don't know the Bible well enough. You know, I, I'm, I'm not qualified to talk about that stuff. Listen to me, knowledge does not qualify you to be a witness in God's kingdom. Knowledge does not qualify you to be a witness in God's kingdom. I know that's how everything else works. I know that that just about everything else, it's education, it's knowledge, it's experience that qualifies you. But when it comes to sharing the love of Jesus, it's not about your credentials and it's not about your speaking ability. What did the Jewish authorities note about Peter and John? They were ordinary. They were unschooled, but they had been with Jesus. I don't care if you've never been to a Bible study in your whole life, if you don't have a theology degree or a library card, if you think lamentations is something people do to paper, 
None of this matters. Being a witness in God's kingdom is not about any of that. It is about your answer to this question right here. Have you been with Jesus? Have you been with Jesus? That's the question that we must answer. Have your eyes been opened? Has your heart been moved? Is your life being continually transformed by the presence and the power of the King of Kings? Do you believe with all your soul that he rose from the dead and that he holds authority over sin and death and that all who follow him will receive eternal life? Do you believe that Jesus is the world's true hope, that he is alive today and one day is gonna come back to judge the earth, that justice and grace find their true home and their purest expression under his rule, that he is love incarnate, love the likes of which can be found nowhere else, and that there is no other name in heaven or on earth by which mankind can find eternal life. These are the questions that cut to the core of what it means to be a witness in God's kingdom. It's not about your education or your knowledge. It's not about your speaking ability or your theological aptitude. It's not about your, it is about your relationship with him and the convictions in your heart that flow out of that relationship and the time that you've spent in his presence. Peter and John were fishermen. They weren't scholars. There were a lot of things they didn't know. I can't prove it, but I'm pretty sure Peter once thought he could outswim a boat. These guys weren't geniuses. They didn't have degrees in theology or seminary training. Many of us are far more educated than they would ever become. And yet they turned the world upside down. Everywhere they went, Faith in God exploded and people turned their lives over to the lordship of Jesus. And eventually their testimony and their teachings were so powerful that they eclipsed the Roman empire itself and spread across the whole earth. How in the world did they do that? They had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. They were full of, of the spirit of Jesus. They walked with the spirit of Jesus and they allowed him to work in them and to speak through them. So what happened after Peter's incredible speech? Did all the Jewish authorities get on their knees and and repent of their sins and receive Jesus as the Lord of their lives? No, unfortunately not. And that's important for us to recognize because Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit and Peter is doing everything he can do to be a witness to the Lordship of Jesus. He gives this incredible speech about Jesus's resurrection from the dead and his place as the cornerstone of God's kingdom. And what do the hearers do? They send them out of the room to deliberate about how they might punish them. Not everyone you witness to will have a conversion experience. Not everyone you share Jesus with will turn from their sin. Not everyone that you show kindness and grace and hospitality and love to will respond in kind. And that's okay. That is okay. It is not your responsibility. We are responsible for what Jesus has told us to do. He has called us to be witnesses We trust God with the outcome. So the council confers. They want to punish them in some way, you know, but 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 the miracle that had happened, it it happened publicly, and, and they're afraid of what the people will do. There's an interesting parallel here with Jesus' lives. The very same people, the very same authorities that for so long wanted to kill Jesus, but they refrained because they were afraid of the people. And now they finally succeeded in killing Jesus. Now they're in the exact same situation with Jesus' followers. What can we do? And so they finally come to a conclusion. Verse 18 says, they called them in again, commanded them not to speak or teach at all 
in the name of Jesus. This is the only thing they could do. They, they, they didn't know what to do. They wanted to suppress the preaching. They wanted to, to, to quash this, this movement that they considered to be you know, a, a, a heresy. But the healing had left so many people in awe. So many people had come to faith in Jesus so that they couldn't flog the disciples. They, they couldn't exile them. They certainly couldn't kill them. And so they resorted to threats and bullying hoping to silence the gospel of Jesus through intimidation. Verse 19, Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help but speak about what we have seen and heard. And notice the same man, the very same man who once hid in fear of these very same men now openly defies them in the middle of their own court. The former coward, not so easily intimidated anymore. And what Peter and John say to the council is powerful. You you realize they recognize their authority. We have that line there, you be the judges. They say it is within your power to judge whether we should listen to God in this matter or to you. You can stop us with force if that's what you decide is best. Look at that last line. We cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. What did they see and heard? Of course, they walked with Jesus for three years. They saw the blind receive their sight and the lame walk. They saw the dead come back to life. They had heard the words of life spoken from the mouth of God himself. John had personally watched him die on the cross. All the disciples had seen his corpse There is no question whether Rome had killed him or not. And then they saw him alive for 40 days. It's no wonder their experiences with Jesus had left an indelible mark on their lives. And they couldn't help but talk about it. But that wasn't all they'd seen. It wasn't all they'd heard. Since Jesus had ascended, they witnessed the birth of the church. They knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that God was with them and signs and wonders and thousands who had come to faith and the miraculous healing in the name of Jesus that they've been brought before the council for that very reason. They could not help but talk about these things too. And to my fellow Christians in the room, this is the question that we have to answer. Can you help it? Can you help it? Can you help but speak about what you've seen and what you've heard? I want you to think about your life for just a minute. Reflect on your experiences with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit. Have you experienced grace and mercy firsthand? Have you seen prayers answered and hearts healed and lives transformed? Have you seen marriages that were on the brink find redemption and and families reunited and and brokenness made whole in the power of Jesus? Sick people healed and the doctors saying, we can't explain it. Have, Have you been through challenges, made it to the other side and said, if it hadn't been for the Lord, I don't know what would happen to me. Have you witnessed the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your own life, his activity through God's people to speak and to move and to act for the advancement of the kingdom? And if so, then you know exactly what Peter and John are talking about. You know exactly what they mean. We can't help but speak about what we've seen and what we've heard and what we know to be true. And you can make all the threats you want. Throw us back in jail, beat us, exile us, kill us if you have to. We can't help it. So let the world know, Jesus is the world's true Lord. We are his witnesses. And so let your family know, Let your friends know, let your coworkers know, let your neighbors know what you have seen, what you have heard, what you have experienced. This is the privilege of a witness. We've seen and we've heard things that other people would call impossible, but we know them to be true because somewhere deep inside us, a whisper 
and our souls bears witness to them. And it's not just hope, it is a living hope. It is the spirit of God alive within us, telling us that Jesus really did rise from the dead and the spirit should know because he was there. And he tells us that Jesus really is exactly who he says he is, that he really is coming back. And that despite the challenges and the hardships and the tragedies that we face in life, he really does love us more than we could begin to understand. And what can the world say to silence us about what we know to be true? Nothing. Can't help it. After further threats, they let them go. And they could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. My brothers and sisters, we are called to be witnesses. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the same spirit that spoke so powerfully through Peter and John before the council, he lives in us and he still desires to speak through ordinary everyday people like you and me. He wants to empower us to bear witness to the Lordship of Jesus. And the world looks different today than it did 2,000 years ago, no doubt. But the calling to be a witness remains the same. So what stops you from talking about Jesus? How unusual would it be for his name to come up in your home or around the dinner table or when you're chatting with your friends or with your coworkers. You know, one of the ways the Holy Spirit works in the lives of believers is that he speaks. And it's not just if we're finding ourselves standing before the Supreme Court or some, you know, intimidating authoritarian council. It's not just in big moments. It's in ordinary moments, every day moments to encourage, to speak truth, to convict, to warn, to offer grace, and to demonstrate the love that overcame death. And just like the first century apostles, the Holy Spirit wants to work through us we have this privilege, this holy calling of carrying on the mission of Jesus in our context and for our generation. But we must live our lives intentionally for the kingdom. We must seek opportunities to perform acts of kindness and compassion and to tell people about what God has done for us. Not just by what we say, but by how we live, we bear witness to who Jesus is and what his kingdom is about. We are his ambassadors in Abilene, Texas. This is our privilege. Let the spirit speak through you. Questions for reflection and discussion this week. When have you heard the spirit speak through a believer? What was the outcome? Do you feel hesitant to talk about Jesus to others? And what can you do this week to listen more closely to the voice of the Spirit? Would you pray with me? Father, we love you. Help us, Lord, to lean in not just to our personal relationship with you, but God, to that holy calling you've put before each of us to be your witnesses. Would you give us opportunities this week? God, would you put before us so clearly those moments in which you want us to act, you want us to move, and you want us to speak. And Spirit of God, would you fill us up? Would you speak through us? Would you work through us? Lord, let our words be your words. Let our hearts be aligned with yours. I pray, Lord, that each one of us would see those ways in which you want to work through us and that we would be faithful and obedient 
in those moments and in those relationships and in those situations. And right now, God, I just pray over every relationship that is represented in this room. Lord, we live in a broken world. We need your healing. We need your restoration. Holy Spirit, would you use us? Make us agents of the kingdom. All for the name of Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.